Hey, everyone. Hopefully, everyone's here for the telepresence. Uh, what's the official name? Telepresence intro. Intro session. So, uh, my name is Rafi Shloming. Uh, this is Adnan Abdul Hussein, and um, I work at uh, a company called DataWire. Uh, this guy works at Binami. And uh, DataWire, if you haven't heard of us, we are, I think, what's called a brave group of souls uh, who decided to uh, uh, build a company that caters to developers. Uh, so uh, we love application developers. We want to make their lives better. We want to make it easier uh, for them to get their work done. And we love open source. We do this in two ways. Um, we have Ambassador. It's an API gateway built on Envoy. Uh, you may have heard about this. Um, and uh, we also make Telepresence, which um, actually uh, we're happy now as a CNCF uh, project. Um, and com actually, Telepresence alone has thousands of users. Combines, you have many, many thousands of users. So uh, in fact, including Bitnami. And so since we like it better when our users uh, say good things than when you know we say good things, um, I'm going to turn this over to Adnan to uh, give you guys a, uh, an intro into telepresence. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Raphael. <clears throat> so everyone, uh, as Raphael said, uh, I work at Bitnami. If you haven't heard of us, uh, try not to make this a marketing pitch, but uh, we, we are one of the leaders in application, <laughs> oh. Oops, sorry. In application packaging, uh, in VMs, containers, cloud images, installers, uh, a whole range of different uh, packaging tools. Uh, we are a Kubernetes certified service provider. Um, which means we, we sometimes will come to events like this and provide training and, and other things. Uh, we've also, <clears throat> we also have a range of different open source projects that we develop. One of them I'm going to be talking about today, which is CubeApps, which is what I work on. Um, and it's what we use Telepresence with to, to help us develop that. Um, and we've also worked on other things like Helm, uh, KubeCFG, and other stuff with, with some of our partners. Um, and we also maintain some of the, the official Helm charts. Um, so Kubernetes is, we kind of see it as like a really great production environment. A lot of our customers uh, will, will tell us that, uh, that they love deploying stuff on Kubernetes and it just makes it, it's just a really great environment to run production workloads on top of. Um, you know, it has a lot of great primitives built in, uh, things like services and load balancing uh, to your deployments, your stateful sets, um, all of that good stuff that just works. Um, the problem is what we often hear is that the development experience is, is not that great, and we, we found that ourselves when we, when we develop, develop tools on that as well. Um, you know, just to give a kind of an example, if you're developing an, an application on top of Kubernetes, it might look something like this, where you, you, know, you, you kind of have these different services that connect to maybe a database that's either inside the cluster or external to the cluster. Um, you'll have like a front end or, or an ingress that's kind of uh, finding its way to those different services. Um, and to develop an application like that inside, uh, uh, to develop a, a Kubernetes native application like that, you might have something like this, which is a stock compose file. Uh, I actually took this from the Monocular project, um, which, is, which is something that uh, we worked on previously. Um, and I just have all my different services that I'm, that I'm developing here in this stock compose file, uh, have things like volumes, um, environment variables that I'm plugging in, um, vocal, uh, local volumes that I'm, that I'm trying to mount in. And these are all things that Kubernetes has already solved for me, but I'm having to re-implement it in Docker Compose just so that I can develop my application. So I know how much we all like YAML, right? Um, I don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of having to manage two different types of YAML and two different environments entirely to like manage this one thing, like it can quickly become, it can quickly get really hairy and, and go really wrong. And you have all these different paths that are uh, intertwining with each other. Um, so it'd be really nice if we could just have one set of manifests and, and manage that one thing and then just be able to develop using that. Um, so we're looking into tools that uh, we could do with that. Um, there, there are other tools like scaffold and draft um, that we looked at, um, and, and then we found telepresence as well. Uh, one of the things that we needed in, <clears throat> in our case for cube apps is we use things like ingress, jobs, and cron jobs 
um, init containers. We have, we're, we're building controllers as well. So in order to do that, we'd have to, uh, like in Docker Compose, we'd have to mount kubeconfig cube for extensions. Um, so obviously, again, going back to the point, we don't, we don't want to have to re-implement all of this for Docker Compose. Um, so we really needed a way to do this inside of Kubernetes. Um, another way of doing this, and this is similar to what uh, Scaffold and Draft kind of do, is they go into this like development cycle where you know you build an image, you push it up to a registry, and then you either do a kubectl set image or you do or, you know Draft or Scaffold can kind of do that for you. <clears throat> um, but that can take some time, and especially the, the application that we're working with is a, is a React application. Uh, I don't know if you work with Node.js, but it takes a bit of time to do some things sometimes. So you've got the classic you know, developer slacking whilst, whilst Docker is building or whatever. Um, so then we came across Telepresence, um, which is, again, by Datawire. Um, and the way Telepresence works is that you have all your services that are already deployed in, inside of your Kubernetes cluster, and you tell Telepresence that you want to replace a certain uh, a pod or, or deployment with a proxy back to your local machine. So with this setup, I can deploy uh, my application into my cluster or into my shared cluster or a cluster running locally that I've set up, something like Minikube or um, I use Docker for, for Mac uh, Kubernetes support. Um, and it just works the same way. It just picks up my cube config, and I tell it what deployment I want to point it to. And it will go and replace that pod with a, with a proxy that then points to a port uh, on my local machine. And additionally to that, I also get service discovery. So now I can talk to anything uh, in the cluster, and it's using S shuttle for that. Um, volumes, it mounts, so it mounts the volumes that are mounted into, that, uh, into your pods using uh, SSHFS. Uh, and I have the exact same, essentially the exact same environment I would have running that uh, thing inside that pod, like if I did kubectl exec, for example. Um, but it's all in my local machine. Uh, so before I go into a, a demo here, there's a couple different proxying methods that, um, that Telepresence supports today. Uh, I know there's some changes that are coming as well around that, and Raphael can speak to that later. Um, but there's kind of, the, I guess, the main method or like the, the default method is the VPN method, uh, which works well if you're developing Go services. Uh, but there is a caveat in that it won't work while there are other VPNs uh, or if you're connected to other VPNs on your machine. So if you're connected to your company VPN and need that, it kind of you have to turn it off and then, and then use the VPN method. So it kind of interferes with that. Um, the second method is inject TCP, <coughs> excuse me, which uh, basically works by injecting a shared library into the process to, to basically reroute uh, network calls to, uh, to telepresence. Obviously, this is not going to work for statically linked things because, um, because, it, because it requires on that, uh, that shared library, right? Um, as a result, that's not going to work well with Go because often you're compiling into a, a statically linked binary. Um, the other method, method, which is really cool, is the Docker method. So this, this works well if you're already developing, uh, if your development environment already has Docker containers. Um, and you can do things like Docker run to, to set up a, uh, a container to run. Um, and it will just run a, 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 essentially a sidecar container with, with the network stack set up to talk to your uh, telepresent proxy. And then, and, and yeah, so that's just, that's just an ideal, um, sorry, so, and then the container that it runs for you will share the same networking stack as, as the, the, the other container. Um, so yeah, that, that's really great if, you, if you're already uh, using containers in your development environment today. Um, so it's, it's fun to talk about, but it's way more fun to do an actual demo. So let's head on over to that. Um, hopefully this is big enough for all of you at the back. Can you, can you see that? Cool. Okay, so I'm just gonna make it a little bit bigger just in case. Uh, oops, I just reset it. That was silly. Okay, so 
Um, I have a Kubernetes cluster set up right now. It's actually using Docker for Mac uh, Kubernetes because I don't want to worry about the network right now. Um, but I have a, if I just do kubectl I'll get pods here. Um, I have some services running in this cluster already. Um, the, ones, the one that I have here is, <clears throat> it's just a basic API called uh, QOTM, which is quote of the month. And it just responds some JSON with a, a quote. Uh, and then I have this telepresence test uh, container as well, which is which we can take a look at. Uh, I guess first let me just show you the, the service here. Um, so I have this QOTM service that's, that's uh, running on port 5000. And um, it's a cluster IP service. So I don't have access to it right now uh, outside of the cluster. Um, so I have this telepresence test uh, file, or deployment, I guess. And this will be my, my application that I'm, that I'm kind of debugging. It has an init container that basically is just seeding some data. So as you can see, it's just mounting a volume, which is an empty data volume, and, and uh, echoing some data to this, uh, this file random. And then the main container start up, starts up, and it's basically just doing a tail of, of that file. Um, I also have a, a secret environment variable here coming, coming in from here as well. So if I take a look at this, if I just do kubectl logs here, I should see that, yep, it works as expected. I'm getting random data out there. Um, but Let's just pretend that there's something wrong with this service, and I want to kind of debug it, and I'm going to use telepresence to do that. So I'm going to we'll do a watch of the pods here just to see what's going on as, as telepresence starts up. But what I'm going to do is so I'm going to tell telepresence to swap deployment, and the name of the deployment is telepresence-test. And I'm going to hit enter on that. Um, and by default, what it's going to do is uh, it's going to start off with the VPN um, proxy method here. And you can see, as this new pod is starting up here, it's still going through that init container process. So it's still still running that init container. And then it, and then it uh, starts up uh, with the proxy. And then it puts me into a bash shell because I didn't provide any other command to it. Um, it just puts me into a batch shell, and I can, I can just run commands in here. So first of all, I'm going to run ls, and I'm in the same directory. Um, so, this is, so this is clearly on my local machine. Um, but we also got this message here saying that volumes are rooted at telepresence root. So if I cd to this, and if I just do a pwd, it's just, it's just a directory that's been mounted to, to temp here. Um, these are the volumes that I got, got from, my, uh, from the pod. And if I go to that data folder here, uh, you can see I have that file called random that was created by the init container. And inside there, it says random data. So that just proves that that init container was run. Um, and I was able to actually see that output. So that, that seems to have worked. Um, interestingly, inside this folder, you can also, uh, if you're familiar with where Kubernetes put uh, its uh, API tokens for pods, uh, the service accounts, they go into this folder here. Um, so if you're writing something that needs to talk to the Kubernetes API, uh, you can use, you can find a token from this directory um, and then use that in your, in your API calls so that you, you can basically reuse that environment and, and uh, develop locally while it's also calling out to the Kubernetes API um, with that service account token. Um, so going back to where we were, uh, okay. oh, the other thing is the environment. So if I, if I run n here, I can see all these environment variables that, are, uh, that have come from the pod, but also the ones that are clearly from my local machine as well. So I have, I've kind of both uh, mixed in here. Um, and I should be able to see, and I can, that secret environment variable here that I, that I put into that, that deployment. Um, so 
all this is to say is I have the exact same environment and, and it, it's just uh, really easy to then debug or like develop applications uh, on top of this now. So going to a kind of more, uh, I guess, real example here. Um, <clears throat> Let's just go here. So I've installed cube apps into my cluster. Um, it's just installable using a Helm chart, and I installed that in the cube apps namespace. Uh, oops. So this is cube apps running in my in my cluster, um, <clears throat> and. What I want to do is when I'm developing this, I want to replace the, the dashboard service, um, which I'm currently connecting to via this, this port forward here that I've run running. Um, and if I go to Chrome here, I'm logged into Cube Apps. So Cube Apps is an application dashboard for your cluster. Um, it allows me to basically deploy and manage Helm charts uh, inside my cluster um, and also manage the service catalog uh, provision services from the service catalog. I haven't set that up right now, but that's, that's something that it can do. Um, but all of this needs to use the Kubernetes API so that it can actually request information about resor what resources are running um, and give you in, uh, output like, you know, what, what uh, pods and, uh, sorry, what IPs and ports are, things are running on so that you can actually access that. Um, so when I'm developing this, I kind of want all of that same environment and all those same things that I, that I have access to, um, but still be able to change that front end app so I can, I can make changes to it and, and develop really rapidly on that. Um, so what we do is we run telepresence and we pass in, once again, we pass in the uh, swap deployment. So the deployment we're going to swap is this one, the QBAP's internal dashboard. Uh, and Set the namespace here to cube apps. Uh, and then we also are going to expose, oops, expose a port from my local machine. Uh, I'm going to use 3000, and we're going to basically replace it with port 8080 here. So that means that port 8080 going into that pod, into the dashboard pod, will then reroute to port 3000 on my local machine. Um, go ahead and run that. So now if I, if I refresh here, we'll, we'll see this, this doesn't work anymore because nothing's running on port 3000 yet, so it can't actually reach anything. Um, but now if I were to go into the front end code here and then start up my development server, so I'm just using Yarn, which is um, like an alternative to NPM, just running Yarn run start there, and that's going to start up that development server. And once that's up and running, And this is again why we chose not to build containers and push them up because it can take that, just that long to, to start the development server. Um, so you can only imagine how long it takes to build. Uh, but now that's running, I can click refresh here. And once again, I have access to the same thing. It looks the same, um, except that it's actually running off of my local machine uh, from this. And I can even, it, you can see if I go to this address here on my local machine. Uh, I can do all the same things, but it's actually not going to work because it can't actually access the Kubernetes API. Whereas over this ingress that I already have that has roots to the Kubernetes API, everything just works. So to demonstrate that this is actually working, I'm going to open up the, the code base here. And <clears throat> of course, if, if, you're, if you're used to developing web apps, you're probably used to something like a live reload. Um, so this is just a React app here. Um, this is the page that's actually, or this is the file that's actually used to render this, this application's page. And if I were to change this header here, to say hello, uh, or applications from Kubecon, let's say, uh, and then I click save, and oops, if I go here eventually, what we'll find is it gets picked up 
that change, and it just reloads, and my, my head has changed. Um, and once again, this is all happening. If I, if I refresh here, we can see it's recompiling here. It's picked that up. Uh, once it gets recompiled, uh, it'll refresh the browser with that change. Now, if I were to exit Telepresence, uh, let's just go and control C here. I've, I'm, do I'm done developing. Um, what it's going to do if we go back to, uh, well, it's going to look to see it. But if I refresh here now, it goes back to what it was uh, there before, basically just doing a, a rollback on that deployment. Um, yeah, and that's, that's basically how we're using it to develop cube apps. Um, that's all I have for a demo. Raphael, do you want to come up and speak towards the roadmap? Sure. So, um, yeah, so this is, uh, th that's a great demo of where we are sort of today. Um, I think we're at, what, 0.9 something? 0.94. Uh, yeah, 0.94. Uh, we try to release, you know, frequently, so it's hard to track the number. Um, but uh, the, the things we're really looking to get to before sort of we consider it 1.0 um, are a bunch more things on robustness and sort of speed of the UX, right? So um, if you're using this in a sort of a network flaky environment, um, you might appreciate reconnect. Um, that's something right now. Uh, if your network connection dies, you know, you sort of have to set up everything again and it's a little bit of a pain. Um, and sometimes when that happens, because the client depends on, um, uh, the client does cleanup in the cluster, um, that cleanup doesn't happen. So we'd like to make that cleanup happen automatically. So this is sort of a little less manual grunge. Um, startup speed can be a bit slow. Um, that's something we're, we're working towards. And uh, one, of the, one of the things we've encountered is when people, um, when people roll this out, uh, they need a certain set of uh, RBAC rules, and so we'd like to minimize that so it's sort of as easy to deploy um, as possible. Um, and uh, it, uh, the, what, what we have found, even though we offer a variety of proxy methods, is that inject TCP is, because of the, the sort of limitations, it's, it's getting less and less sort of useful. So we'd like to... Um, uh, we'd like to eliminate that before we hit 1.0 so that, you know, we don't have to support it going forward. So we're actually pretty much 95% uh, of the way there on, on this stuff, which right? I guess it makes sense since we're about version 0.94. Um, that, of course, worked out on purpose. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and so the, we're, we're at this sort of place where, um, where we have sort of uh, made a bunch of uh, architectural changes to do um, pretty much all this stuff. Uh, but we're in this interesting situation with Telepresence because it is, uh, it is a command line program. It runs, in, uh, it, runs in, it runs on people's laptops. People's laptops run on different networks. Um, what it is doing uh, you know, is sort of working at a network level, at multiple network levels. It messes with DNS. Um, it messes with your firewalls. Um, and stuff like that. And so that, th those things are sensitive to all aspects of your environment. Um, you know, as, as a little example, you know, we, had, we may still have some code at some point that, or it, that, that actually does a query uh, for a DNS name that it, that it knows doesn't exist in order to uh, figure out some stuff, right? If you're running in, uh, uh, on a network which happens to have DNS configured so that every single name resolves to an ad, that code kind of breaks. Um, and so, uh, right, and so there's lots of little things like that. And, you know, to make it even worse on Max, you know, um, I think Max, uh, I, I, until, until I got involved in this, I didn't learn that Max actually, I didn't realize, but Max actually cached negative DNS lookups. Um, so if you get a DNS lookup failure um, and you, you know, swap your DNS, um, you'll still get that negative, that NX domain uh, result. Um, until the cache decides to flush. Um, and there are actually ways you can manually flush this. In fact, we have incorporated code to do that. But um, the, the way to do that, I think it's changed four or five times over, the, over sort of the recent uh, set of Mac. In fact, it went, 
what? It's gone back and forth between, between different versions. So I have, I, unfortunately, I don't have a slide, but there's a great snippet of code um, that has less than, greater than on minor version numbers to figure out the right way to flush DNS caches. Um, so while we have architecturally sort of uh, put the stuff in place and we have a, com a component that's sort of, it's almost a new method uh, uh, to, uh, to do this proxying, um, that we believe is sort of uh, is uh, more flexible, robust, it could, more robust, and can do all these things. Um, well, we have that, that. We're in this place where we don't want to just roll it out uh, because we don't want to. You know, a lot of people use telepresence. We don't want, and it, it's working for them in their environments uh, uh, that they have, and we don't want to just break that. Um, and so, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, that that's sort of uh, where we're. Um, where, we, where we are now, sort of looking at, at how to introduce, uh, introduce this new functionality um, in a way that we, can, uh, that we can sort of incrementally roll out. Um, and, that, and once we get there, we'll, we'll call that 1.0 in the future. Um, in the future, uh, part of the architectural changes we've made, um, uh, we want to enable sort of um, some more flexible use cases. So the swap deployment uh, scenario you saw was kind of combining three three sort of categories of use cases, right? It's replicating the execution environment, um, the file system, the environment variables, all the stuff that the init containers are doing. So it's replicating the execution environment um, in Kubernetes on your laptop. Um, it's also taking outbound network traffic from your laptop and directing it back to the cluster. Um, and it's capturing inbound traffic from the cluster and bringing it down uh, to your network, and it turns out if you, uh, we think if you actually break these into a little bit more of a toolkit, you can put these together in some interesting ways. Like you can uh, maybe shadow traffic from a live cluster um, that you wouldn't want to necessarily send uh, run t telepresence on directly, or send um, uh, or send traffic back into, and then you can actually take uh, that traffic, uh, you know, bring it down to your laptop, you know, run on an execution environment that may be replicated from a development or staging cluster, send the traffic back into that development or staging cluster in a way that's totally safe, won't mess with anything on production. Um, so, and you know, one of the, one of the I, I recently learned that, uh, that um, turns out choices, even though we think are, they're, they're a good thing, actually, when people have more and more choices, um, it turns out beyond a certain point, um, that actually makes people less happy. So we'd like to, <laughs> we'd like to remove some of the choices, right? You saw how complicated that that method slide was, and the, the sort of the matrix of understanding what what works with what. That's not something uh, we'd like you to have to think about. Um, so simpler UX, um, and you know maybe sort of more first class support for um, higher level developer tools like IDEs, um, service meshes, that kind of thing. So that's that's where we'd like to go. Um, we're doing a, uh, we're doing a uh, sort of uh, more in-depth talk on some of that stuff on th Thursday. Um, so hopefully we'll get some feedback um, and uh, see. You know, I'd love to hear from people who've used telepresence and anger if any of our ideas sound like they would be useful going forward. So. Um, yeah, does the telepresence deep dive at? Do you know what time? Yeah, it is I, uh, I don't know what time. Uh, offhand, I'm sorry. Actually, I, th I think it was tomorrow. I think it's Wednesday. Oh, is it Wednesday? Yeah. Um, ah, okay. <coughs> Do you know what time? <laughs> uh, I want to say it's in the 2.45-ish time slot. Yeah, I think it's in the afternoon, so. Okay, well, yeah, it's, it's on the schedule. Um, yep. The deep dive telepresence. Uh, 145. 145, thank you. Great. So, and it is tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Uh, okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. So there's one. There, there is a talk about telepresence at 145. You can see some uh, uh, another set of use cases around uh, uh, around how it's used. Um, cool. Good stuff. Yeah. Oh, any questions? Yes. Yeah, uh, I can. We can repeat the question as well. Oh, yeah. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I, so one of the one of the projects I was hoping to use telepresence in when building an end-to-end workflow as a POC for another team um, was unable to. I was really unable to use telepresence, um, but not because of anything wrong with telepresence. It was because 
what telepresence was actually good for in that case was ex exposing the fact that the app really was fell pretty short of being a 12 factor app. And telepresence assumes that your apps are in, in, in some serious ways. Like for example, if you're if you have a legacy application that uses you know a POSIX, uh, like say user file uploads, for example, um, those of course those uploads are not going to be in your local container that you're swapping the deployment with. Your let's say your staging or your production um, deployment up in Kubernetes. So those are not going to be there. So if your application relies on those, you're out of luck. Um, I was curious if given that you're already building in proxying, if that would be an interesting potential feature for you for, you know, if the idea is um, that telepresence is a helpful application to help you improve your applications within Kubernetes, then, you know, if the goal is to target not only, you know, already rock solid 12 factor apps, but to help kind of give more stages in a sort of lift and shift way for mm -hmm. legacy be in Kubernetes and then get better and better and improve, um, is a feature that you would be interested in something like a staged file proxy yes. feature? Yes. Did you see what I mean? Where, the, where you wouldn't assume that those files would be in your local, uh, your local proxy, your local deployment while, it, while they would be in your, your uh, production one or your staging one or whatever. Um. I'm not sure if that was really very clear about the problem, but... Um, so let me, let, me, yeah. let me see if I understand. I'm probably not going to get this quite right. Uh, but it, sound, so you, it sounded like you had problems because you, the, the source of your... What is it? The source, was the source of your problem that the application depended on, on sidecars, you said? Or, uh, or, no, it was or, even more uh, less sophisticated than that. The app, let's, let's mention, um, for example, uh, let's say um, I saw one of the... One of, the, one of the other demos uh, that you had up there, Adam, was a WordPress site, right? So let's just say projects like that depend on user file uploads. Oh, Not oh. Not really 12 factor at all. Oh, sorry, user file upload. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha, I miss it. So as in, um, you know, as in sort of shared volume uh, kind of thing. That's right, and there's a few different ways to solve that. You'd have to do that completely outside of telepresence. Um, yes. Yeah, I think we do a read-only thing. I mean, it cer certainly, uh, I think uh, there's n nothing about that sounds like it's something that telepresence shouldn't solve. Um, you know, it's it's um, uh, you know, I, it's a little bit trickier dealing right just because of you know uh, the we're using SSHFS under the covers. SSH, SSHFS is uh, most almost read-only um, as a as a file system, and so when you get into shared file systems, yeah, you, we, we basically need a custom, um, sort of a custom proxy thing. And you know, I think it, it would, would totally make sense to have something like that at some point. Um, you know, I think as we sort of dig down, you know, Telepresence started out as sort of a, an assembly of mostly off-the-shelf things, and we've sort of, you know, started making more sort of custom pieces as we realized sort of the limits of what we could do with that. That, that totally makes sense as a, as a piece to, uh, you know, I can't tell you when that would happen, but I'd love it if somebody would contribute a chunk like that. Um, and I'd be happy, you know, if it's something you're interested in, in, in poking at, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to ask you So it's used by uh, our team on Cube Apps. Um, I don't think it's been adopted in every team, uh, but certainly within the Kubernetes team, we, we're using it. Um, we're pretty much one of the only teams that's developing or that requires a lot of the Kubernetes APIs as well uh, with Cube Apps. So that's kind of the reason why we look for something like that, whereas other teams don't necessarily have that problem. But I know some other teams do have the problem where they're kind of maintaining both Compose and, and Kubernetes YAML at the same time. So I know they want to switch to, to something like this as well. So how does it work for you? Does every engineer spin up development environment in Kubernetes and has his own personal development environment in Kubernetes where he can just plug in? Or do you use shared environment? So we, we actually do. That's a good question. So the question was whether we use shared environments or if we spin up our own clusters. Um, we actually do a little bit of both. Um, I 
prefer to use Docker Compose, uh, sorry, Do Docker for Mac. Um, I, some other folks t tend to use Minikube, um, and then some folks use our shared cluster and run cube apps in their own namespace and then swap it out on there. But, it, but, it, but Telepresence works across all of those, um, so that workflow is the same. But, but yeah, we do have these kind of different environments. In some way, it's useful because it allows us to test cube apps in all those different environments as well. Um, but at some point, I think it would be nice to just have one shared environment, shared cluster where we all, we're all developing on and, and we're able to just swap out things there. Um, yeah. Yes. So if you're exposing your cluster that's exposed to the internet and redirecting that internet traffic to your local machine, is it up to the DevOps team or whatever to secure the ingress so that only yeah, I think so. So in our development clusters, they're not exposed to the internet. Um, Telepresence just just works over kubeconfig and and configures the um, just yeah. It, it's just working kind of as as a local proxy um, or tunnel, I guess. Uh, it's not actually exposed to the internet for for our use case. But if you were, then yeah, you'd probably want to use some sort of internal load balancer. I know there's some work going on as well to. Um, route to different endpoints based on uh, an authorization header or something? Yes. So the, one, of the, one of the areas we're working on, one of the reasons we want to separate that sort of inbound um, execution outbound stuff um, is, uh, yeah, it's because, yeah, you can only swap one, only one person can swap a deployment at a time, which means to benefit from telepresence, you need a way to um, sort of make your cluster multi-tenant with respect to developers, whether you sort of have a d cluster per developer or whether you have a uh, namespace per developer, one way or another you need to set that up. Um, and so there's, you know, other strategies uh, to do sort of, you know, per request routing where, where it would actually be much easier to roll out, you wouldn't have to do that. Um, and so we'd like to be able to support those kind of things. Uh, and, and you know, in in that kind of scenario, that gets much more realistic to to put into a production um, setup and an integrate with authentication, um, so that you know only authenticated requests are uh, allowed to be uh, allowed to be directed, you know, to uh, to a laptop. Okay, cool. I think we're slowly creeping over to the next talk, so yeah. uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, but thank you all for attending. Right, thanks. <laughs>